Hello everyone, welcome to Drum Fills Cafe. My name is Dennis and welcome to a second uh, world edition of season two. Thank you for joining us, for joining us basically. Uh, as usual, I invite you to look up the YouTube, Facebook and Instagram pages to subscribe, to like and to share those pages with your friends. Tonight, three different drummers. First drummer we're going to talk to you is from the Toronto area. Uh, someone who basically is very big on education and inspiring people to pick up an instrument and especially drums. Uh, second drummer is a multi-instrumentalist, basically plays pretty much every instrument out there, and one of them is drums. And uh, third drummer, sorry for keeping score, is a Nashville drummer who's played with a lot of different artists and especially with an artist called Jason Aldean. So very excited to talk to him as well. Let's start uh, with the first drummer of the evening, a man who's been playing for about 30 years now. As I've stated, uh, very big on the educational side. He has uh, three different books out there. Uh, four with the, an inspirational book. Uh, some of those books will be uh, Messing with the Bull, Groove of the Dills, and Turning Up and Lay It Down. Uh, it's played with various artists from uh, Randy Bachman, Lee Aaron, to Kalen Porter from Canadian Idol, for instance. And uh, just basically a very inspiring uh, teacher. If you're looking for a good teacher in that area, I would highly recommend this man. And if he's not teaching, he actually has a hot sauce for sale. And uh, very interesting to talk about that. So anyways, without further ado, I would love to welcome to Drum Fields Cafe, Mr. Jeff Salem. So hello from Montreal all the way to, I believe you're in Brampton or Toronto I, area. I, 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 yes, I, I am in Brampton. I'm just might just change this angle here for a second. Yeah. Is that, you can, that, that, that's an okay view right there. That's, that's yeah, perfect. That's it's beautiful drums. There's a okay. couple of educational yeah. stuff. In there. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, if you want to give me a kind of a run through or a genuine, um, I'm just curious just so I, I can plan how, how long did you want this interview to be roughly? So, so it is about uh, 25 minutes, 20, 25 oh, okay. minutes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And um, okay. basically, okay. So basically what we normally do is to kind of go uh, a bit of the background. So how you started, what got you interested. Yeah. So that way, yeah. you know, the viewers yeah. sort of relate to that kind of story. Yeah. And then once from, from there, we kind of talk about uh, who you've played with and how is that experience and uh, what you, you know, what do you kind of recommend okay. to sit different situations when you play with different artists. Okay. And of course, Perfect. with, with your, with you, I want to touch upon uh, the educational side because you do a lot of yeah. educational side. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I, I even, I even had some of my books just if we wanted to get a perfect. discussion. That's perfect. Or, you know, that's get, perfect. Uh, cool, man. I, I'm ready to rock anytime you want to record, <laughs> and we're, we're, we're golden, man. I had my coffee, so I'm good. <laughs> so first things first, uh, Jeff. How did you start for drums? What what attracted you to the instrument? Oh, back okay. Then? Well, you know, a lot of times you always hear a common story from you know uh, a, a young drummer saw the Beatles playing on the Ed Sullivan show. Go, right, That's right. it. I want to be Ringo Starr. Right. Well, for me, I mean, uh, I'm a little younger than that era, but <laughs> believe it or not, it goes back to a sitcom called The Brady Bunch. I don't know if you remember that, the comedy yes. show from the late 60s and 70s. There was an episode where the young son, Bobby Brady, got a set of drums. And right. I remember watching that and, and, you know, he couldn't play, you know, they, you know, he was just making a lot of noise, but it looked like he was having fun. And they kept moving the drum set, you know, in different rooms and stuff. And I'm sure you can probably find that episode on YouTube. But I remember watching that and I was at that time probably about, you know, 10 years old. And I was mm. like, that's, that's what I want to do. <laughs> and, and of course, you know, I, I asked my parents, you know, can I, you know, play drums? No, 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 no. You know, it's that that's noise is not going to happen. So, right. you know, I spent the next couple of years like, you know, air drumming until I got into high school. And it was, I was 13 years old and I signed up for a music program to want to get drums. But unfortunately, I got stuck on clarinet. Right, right, <laughs> so, right. so, so the true story behind that is when, when I, you know, walked out of the music class, I'm like, strike two, get an instrument I want. Hmm. Uh, there was a music music store close to me where I grew up in Toronto, and I went and I bought a pair of sticks. And, and I re this is the thing I always remember very interesting. This was September twenty fifth, nineteen eighty. And wow. when I was in that when I was in that music <laughs> store, they announced on the radio John Bonham passed away from Led Zeppelin. Oh, Kurt, why? Right, so right, that's right. a very that was a very significant thing. And of course, I came home and I told my parents that I got stuck playing drums in school. And I said, I don't need a drum set; I need a practice pad. So I was practicing clarinet in the morning and practice my practice pad. And they found out during the you know the Christmas concerts. I kind of lied to them, but they saw the commitment and dedication I had towards that. So 
it really started for me in high school, the journey of learning percussion. That's, that's where it went. And Bobby Brady was my influence. So, so when I started taking drum lessons, like my teacher goes, who, who are some of your influential drummers? And, you know, you hear people say, Neil Peart, you know, uh, John Bonham. Yeah. I'm like, Bobby, Bobby Brady. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. It's a great story. Yeah. Um, and from there, did you, did you study with someone? Did you go on to study yeah. uh, different places? I, 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 yeah, absolutely. So for, for me, uh, my educational be began, so uh, I, I, I took lessons at that local store. Right. And, you know, after about three months, a teacher said, I taught you all I can teach you. So <laughs> it's like, you need to find a more advanced teacher. And then I looked around the area and, and I highly recommended uh, a gentleman named Dan Bodanis, who we're still friends today. And mm. I studied with him for about, you know, a good solid four years was my main foundation of learning during my high school era. And it's, it's funny, like Dan and I are still in contact. He's a wonderful drummer. He's a great educator. And I actually uh, have taught his son for many, many years. And okay. after Dan, I went to study with a lot of great uh, teachers in the Toronto area. I, I studied with Rick Rat for quite a bit, a gentleman yeah. named Robin Boris. Right. And I took a lot of took a lot of one-off lessons and stuff. And, and I was post-secondary school. I, I did went to audition for the Hubbard College program and, mm. you know, geared, ready to go for that. And But that at, at that time, I also auditioned for a band, a Canadian well-known band at the time called Fist. They were from Ottawa. So it's like My hometown. They, <laughs> they offered me the gig. And I was like, I was quite young. I was only 18 at the time. So I'm like, okay, let's go on the road, playing big venues, you know, tour bus, you know, arenas, maybe clubs, or go to school. 18 years old, what's it going to be? <laughs> yeah. So, so I, I obviously chose the li live performance route, but the important thing for me is I, I promised myself I would discipline myself hmm. to continue studying. And, you know, that kind of snowballed into many other gigs at that time. So, you know, this is, you know, way before internet stuff. So yeah. whenever I was in a town or city, I, I would try to find out, like, who's the hotshot teacher? And I would try to book a lot of one-off lessons and stuff like hmm. that. So... And, and then from that era, that, that's when I met a lot of like global uh, educators like Dom Famulero. I had some lessons with him for right, right. quite a while. Uh, Jim Chapin as well too. I did a few classes as well with Joe Morello, just to you know refine oh, wow. working on working on technique and stuff. So a, a big part of my uh, livelihood mm -hmm. as used, I would say from 1986 to 1993. Was, was was touring and playing with a lot of mostly rock, hard rock style bands. And then I remember coming home one day from the road and I got a call to go do a gig. Uh, an old friend of mine called me, he said it was a wedding gig. And he said, uh, I said, what's the material going to be? And he says, like, well, we're going to play a bunch of standards. I go, what do you mean standards? So mm. he was he was referring to a lot of stuff from like the real book, you know, playing swing tunes, bossa nova, samba. My standards at that time was like, oh, Iron Maiden, Judas Priest, but let, let, let's let's define standards, <laughs> right? And you know, I I didn't feel comfortable accepting the gig. You know, first of all, I didn't mm. have a tuxedo to wear. I had spandex and. So at, at that point, it got me back into, you know, pulling up old books that I studied. Like, I own hundreds and hundreds of drum books. And at that era, I wanted to become a student again. It says, hey, listen, I spent a lot of time understanding jazz and a lot of world music, but didn't bring it to a professional performance level. Mm. I understood it, but, you know, I had a lot of kilometers in playing hard rock and metal right. in experience. But in that genre, I was still in my driveway, if you know what I mean. So... Mm -hmm. So that that that's that that was a little bit of a paradigm shift for me to branch into other areas of playing and stuff like that. So there, there there's kind of my influence, but but I'll I'll tell you one thing that just always blew my mind and how inspiring it was was that I remember the first year of playing drums, uh, my teacher, this is Dan Bodanis, brought a handful of his students down to a venue in Toronto called the Ontario Place Forum for five bucks on a weekend at jazz festival. Here's who I got to see. Oscar Peterson played, Buddy Rich, Weather no. Report, from no. Montreal, Yuzep was on the bill, no, Pat, yes. Pat Metheny, and Jocko Pastore solo. Five bucks, I was like from here to you to watch him Buddy Rich. And so, you know, you got to imagine, because my early influence, uh, one of my big influences was Ian Pace from Deep Purple. I love oh. that, and the, the hard rock. He was like yes. my first influence yes. 
you know, after Bobby Brady. <laughs> but so, <laughs> so, so when I when I saw drums played the way like like Buddy Rich played and and, and some of those artists, like, like it was just it, it was mind blown. Like, oh my gosh, this is a whole different mm. universe. These these guys are like you know incredible. And uh, but I always remember that. I always remember that concert for five bucks. <laughs> Crazy. You know? Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, but it, but it's interesting because that's what. Uh, just to touch on a bunch of things you just said, um, you know, today everybody's got you know internet, YouTube. You can go on YouTube and find whatever. But back in the day, you know, if you wanted to yeah. actually learn something, you actually had to go and find a teacher. You actually had to kind yeah, of like yeah. sit down with the record and go, "What's he doing yeah. there?" I have to I have to re-listen to that, or you know, and to yeah. try to figure it out, kind of thing, and go on the pad yeah. and go, "I'm not sure. Is this it? Is that it? Da da da, kind of thing." So no. You know, technology today allows us many things to, you know, like here, here's the way I, I, I do like technology today. You know, for example, somebody's in a lesson, like yeah, I have right. a student, I have a student visiting up from Mexico and he's taking some pods. And, you know, I said, what are some bands you like? I go, I've never heard of the band. So bingo, I can go on YouTube hmm. during the class. We can find it. And, and, and sometimes luckily enough, um, you know, before I try to lift it, I might be able to find a drum chart already and purchase that chart. Mm. Do you know, so 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 there's there's where we shorten the time span. Where yeah. like I, you know, when I when I started teaching, you know, the big thing is I don't know if I still have it in the room or not, but I mean. I, you know, one of those tape recorders where you press, you know, play, record, and an audio cassette. And I had students come in and goes, wow, this is phenomenal. I, I get to go home with a cassette recorder. Right, 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 right. And, and, and then from there, I started videotaping my lesson. I had a camera over top, so there was like an aerial view of everything. And I had students who would come in with um, blank VHS tapes. Right, right. And right. Then, then from that evolved to blank DVDs. Now my shelf, there's nothing there. Because you know what happens at the end of the lesson? The student pulls out their phone for yeah, 30 seconds <laughs> and, and, and films a quick synopsis of it. So, right, so, right. so this, is, this is how I try to utilize technology in, in, towards its benefits. So hmm. we can make things faster to get the information quickly across it. But you're right, like in our generation, it'd be like, if I wanted to lift a tune, it's how many times you're rewinding the cassette, the CD player, there, there was no apps or anything to slow it down. No, uh, exactly. You, I, you know, quite challenging at that time. So, you know, we de definitely, you know, paved the road. <laughs> Worked hard for that. <laughs> paid we paid it. We paid our dues, you know. <laughs> All I remember is just trying to, to, to learn jazz, and I couldn't go on the internet and see Miles Davis kind of blue. I had to actually go to the record store yeah, and yeah. find it, buy it, listen to it, and try to, you know, comp it and that sort of thing. So, yeah, it's very different. Yeah. Um, Definitely. You t I just want to touch on uh, on a band, and I I'm sorry if I go to that, but Saints and Sinners. Oh, uh, yeah, of course. Yeah. Because you were talking about the rock and everything. And by the way, we have many... Uh, uh, Mutual friends? No, uh, <laughs> uh, influences, because I love I oh. love Pace as well. Pace, to me, is just... Uh, I mean, Bonham is awesome, but Pace is just... Yeah. He's up there as well, to me, anyway, yeah. personally. Yeah, no, Pace was my... Um, you know, it's funny. I used to mention this, the question that clinics, I'm like, you know, to give away a prize, I'm like, what song has a drum solo during the verse? And I'm like, what song are you talking? And it was like, right. you know, Burn by uh, Deep Purple. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so going back to, so after the band Fist, uh, there was other, uh, you know, different uh, groups I played with, uh, 21 Guns, then, and then after that I played in the band Sword, which became Saints and Sinners. Well, and, and you know what, and that, that was a great CD that came out with such talented players, but, you know, that type of music, I think if that CD came out in 1989 versus 92, mm. it would it would have been a whole different outcome of just because the grunge thing just started yeah. coming in and that kind of took over that. Mm. And then after that, I, I played with a Canadian artist, um, uh, Lee Aaron. I was just subbing in on that gig I played with for several months and stuff like that. Mm. And then uh, other different kind of metal bands and stuff of, of that generation. But Saints, this is a, that's a great CD. I still listen to that CD. Well, yeah. I, I actually knew I actually knew uh, the song uh, "Walk That Walk." If I correct, oh, if I correct okay, yeah. okay. But the thing is, is also when I went back and listened to a couple of uh, things you did, that band actually had a couple of uh, Quebec players that were uh, yes, yeah, known today. So Rick Hughes, yeah. Stéphane yeah, Dufault, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you were on it, and I believe yeah. the, the guitar player also is uh, well. No, I don't remember his name uh, at the top of my head. Yeah, but was, uh, there was uh, Mar Martin Bolduc. Mademoiselle uh, Bolduc, yeah. 
Yeah, he's from Quebec City. And yeah. uh, because cause when I came with that, like a lot of those tracks were already done. I, I think mm. I'm only playing on, on a few tracks on that. I know Walk This Walk, I played on that, okay. Taking My Chances, and I think two other ones. Some, mm. of, the, some of that was actually just programmed as well, too. I, mm. I can't remember. It's almost, thir- it's almost 30 years ago. That's yeah, the scary no. part about it. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> wow. Yes. Wow. Anyways, didn't want to take you back to to, to uh, Langley, but it just I just um, was amazed by the talent, and actually, that I thought the CD was quite good. So, um, yeah. moving on. So you played with a bunch of different people. So uh, Randy Bachman, I, I believe. Yeah. Uh, so a lot, of, lo, lo, yeah, a lot of those are like Randy Bachman, yeah. uh, Robin Ford. Yeah, uh, exactly. A lot of these, a lot of these would be at music camp. So these okay. would be like one offs, and quite a quite a pressurized situation because sometimes yeah, go ahead, talk about it. There would never there would never be a rehearsal. Like I mm. remember. With Rob, Robin Ford at this camp, they send us his music, maybe a couple charts, mm-hmm. and and it was a trio, and we would do like a forty-five minute set, mm. and it'd be like his only instruction to me. I always remember. I mean, great Robin Ford. He was like, "When I'm soloing, you be on the ride symbol." <laughs> <laughs> You know, um, but but even after uh, so back at a point when I was kind of trying to hone my craft and on all those other genres like world music, jazz, I auditioned to be a musical director on a cruise ship that was doing a world tour. And there was one unique tour where we were going to have some great artists like Diana Krall. So I had a chance to do a show with her on a ship. It was a mining crew. Uh, there was Art Garfunkel. There's the Chieftains. Mm. And, uh, you know, I was out for like six months on that. And everything I played was just basically, you know, you know jazz sticks and brushes and, and mm. i tell my students i said guess how many pairs of sticks i broke during that whole contract they go i don't know it doesn't i go zero yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you know it, 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 it's like instead of this instead of you know doing this kind of stuff it was like you know you're, you're playing on that's the extent of how loud you know right, right, right. The drumming you know what right, I mean? right. so and it's not an easy thing to do exactly no it, it it's hard to play busy stuff quiet it yes. really is yeah. very difficult very challenging and stuff but uh yeah so that so so even in my early 90s i always got inspired to teach i um because one of the first books I wrote, I wrote this double bass book in like 1991. Right, right. Came with a, a VHS video. And it's funny, I have a whole bunch of those VHS videos. You know what they work great on? I'm telling you, this works amazing. So, you know, I, I've done a lot of school programs working with kids and drum yeah. circles. So when I go to the school and you got the door open and you got to bring your stuff and the door doesn't stay open. So I take that I take that VHS video <laughs> and I and I wedge it on the door so it keeps open. And then, then I can then I can bring my dolly in, you know. So they, they sure. work well. They work well for that. <laughs> and I'm sure if you take it back and you actually would find a VHS player today, it would actually still work. <laughs> That's the thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, th- I, th- I think it would. And, you know, the, video, the quality will not be HD. It'll be quite grainy, but. <laughs> you can get the you, you can get the ideas and stuff. Like um, that, but. Well, you're touching it. Well, let's. Well, we can go left and right. But we were touching about it. You're you're very involved into um, drumming circles and and bringing yeah. drums basically to to kids and to various yep. different uh, community. Can you talk about that and where, yeah. how that that come about? Absolutely. So you know, um, I started doing pr- school program back in 1995, and there was a program that uh, Don Fanulier started up at the time called ESP, Educational Seminars and Percussion, mm-hmm. and there was about a, a dozen educators across the you know North America. So I was kind of the Toronto region, and and Sabian sponsored it as well with Vic First, and they would give you a little compensation. That basically the whole idea was the a the band director at school. Okay. So you know I, I would go I would contact I go to the school and offer my service. So a lot of times I have a workshop being myself with the sticks on a snare drum. Just primarily working on school based stuff. So I wanted to see like if you look at a school with a thousand students, but here I'm only maximizing my time, my talent to three students. How can I go beyond that and mm. expand? Then mm. I started a program called Music's My Passion. So I would share with a classroom, let's say a band classroom, or it could even be a vocal classroom, just just you know character traits of trying to be a successful musician as an right. artist. You know, right. it's not all about just learning your craft. There's so many attitude, your business chops, and everything that kind of hone all that together, which, which kind of led me to write this book, Finding Success as an Individual <laughs> Artist. And, and then from there, I thought, well, this is only the band students, so what could be the next thing mm. to do? The next thing was I started getting into hand drumming. And that that was inspired when I worked on a cruise ship gig. When I did that world cruise tour, like 
one port when we were in Africa, some guy came to my door and he said, hey, I bought this djembe. Uh, you think you can teach it to me? And I'm like, well, I don't know much about hand room, but why don't I meet you in the auditorium in a half hour? I'll kind of take skills from here and we'll apply it to that. Right, right, I go right. to the... I, I, I walked to the auditorium on the ship, and that guest, anytime he saw somebody that had a souvenir jambi, he goes, guys, free drum lesson in 30 minutes. <laughs> so so when when I walked in that auditorium, there was like about 50 people with all different drums and really? people from different parts of the world, but they were all excited about learning. Mm. So this, is, this, goes, this goes back to 1999, and then the next port we were in, I remember we were in uh, Tunisia, and I, I picked up my drum, and this is, you know, the internet at the time, I downloaded Jembe Lesson number one. So I became a student with them. Right. So, I was so I was so inspired from that. So when I came home, I went to study with some great hand percussions. Also, uh, Arthur Hall was a great uh, drum circle facilitator. And so then I started adopting that program. I wanted to bring that to the school. So now okay. I don't have a program just for students. I have some, so bands, I have something for, that can engage kindergarten and kids right up to grade 12 students. Right, right, right. And, and, and that's a big part of them doing daycares, retirement homes. And then I formed 11 years ago a percussion group called Enviro Drum. It's like <laughs> kind of stomp meets blue band group. Yep. Free yep. percussionist, keyboard player. I've had it together for 11 years. I have a friend of mine who does the same program in Maryland, USA. So now when I go to a school that may not have a music program, there's an eco department. Then. So now that I can do a whole concert, if the school's got a thousand students, we'll, we'll split it up into two concerts, 500 kids at a time. Mm. So they don't necessarily have to be uh, band suits. So right. this is where I took it from the three kids with snare drums in the band class to the whole entire class called Music My Passion to drum circles now to environmental. So I have both those menus. If we want hands on drumming or if we want more of an educational concert with Enviro Drum. It's kind of funny because that's such an interactive show. And I just did a show, a virtual show for the town of Ajax a few weeks ago. And that, it, it's, we usually get 20 kids coming up. So it was very interesting to put on a show like me talking to the camera. Okay, kids, snap, clap, tap, stop. Right, right, right. Inter yeah. You know, so, yeah. so the school, the schools were, you know, a really big part of, you know, and so unfortunately, when we had the COVID shutdown, I mean, that cleared a lot, over 100 dates on my calendar yeah, <laughs> this yeah. year. Yeah. You know, it's just unfortunate, but it, it is. Everyone's, you know, everyone is feeling this uh, sacrifice and you just, you deal with it, you know what I mean? But, but yeah, so that's the extent of the, you know, the whole school ba background. And I, I still have fun with it. I enjoy it very much and stuff like that. So my, 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 my tip to anyone that wants to get into a school program is, if you can offer some type of a service that can benefit the entire school or a department, the music department, it's an easier sell for the music teacher to present that to the principal. Because it's the principal that has the final say what comes into the school board, you know, right there. For sure. For sure. You, well, you're kind of preaching to the... To the choir because I am part of those percussion groups that actually goes around the schools and everything. And, yeah, and, and yeah. I worked, and I, but I still wanted to have your take about it because usually those kids yeah. are just, you know, oh wow, this is what is this? How, you know, this is so interesting, and and they, they, you can see their eyes kind of open up to the world yeah. of music and percussion. And I thought, yeah, yeah. like like my my whole message to that. So when I, you know, it, it, it's right before COVID shut down. My last school date was March fifth. I was at a school the entire week for the whole week. E e each each student got to see me uh, for two hours in total, different increments. And my whole thing is, even if I can take one percent of that, a thousand students, and just inspire them to learn an instrument, maybe not drum, but just learn an instrument. Exactly. It, mu music's yeah. fun, whether it's piano, guitar, singing, or drumming. Of course, exactly. You know, exactly. that that was just my goal. We need to create more musicians, not kids <laughs> playing video games. You know, <laughs> right? We, yeah. we got a, we got about five or six minutes left already okay. so i want to touch on, on a bunch of things um educational books and then uh, yeah. also talk about your uh, uh um, artist uh, book so of course yeah. there's group there's groovy diddle of course that's uh, oh, yeah. that's yeah. quite that's quite popular i actually yeah. like it quite a lot because you take it to you you do grooves with it but also you do fills and everything that you kind of do with it can fit in different styles true yes. and can and yes. is actually applicable like if i pull out you know example number five or whatever you know the guys in the band won't turn around and go Ooh, what was that like you kind of throw <laughs> us off there i thought it, yeah, and, yeah. I, and i love that because there is a lot of information out there but stuff that you can actually use is also i think yeah yeah, yeah. Really interesting i i have some of those videos up on youtube just ignore the hair down the hair I mean, <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, you know, crazy hair at that time. But uh, well, thank you, Dennis. I appreciate the kind words yeah. on that. So, um, so you have your groove diddle. You have, yeah, um, you show them. You can show your stuff. And what is yeah? What so, about? so um, th- this was a book I wrote for Hudson Music. It's called Messing with the Bowl, uh, right. based on the Turn It Up, Lay it Down series, which was a whole uh, collection of basically just jam along tracks. There was one that was a jazz one. So this was a funk based one. So there's I believe 13 tracks on it. I wrote all the charts for it, uh, mm-hmm. as well as different examples of blues from different levels, like beginner, intermediate, advanced. And there's the whole intro section that talks about like what do artists you know how do they begin their process of making up a group what, what do they have mm. in their toolbox like what mm. would someone like david garibaldi think okay is this group i'm going to base on a linear concept uh no change so there's a lot of information packed in there now you get a digital download mm. and this came out about 12 years ago and i've you know received tons of great feedback about it and a few years after that i'm not sure from this one called the rhythmic twist the whole concept about this book was just getting students comfortable playing triplet bass groove because mm. let, let, let's face it i you know most students are going to have an easier time beginning by just playing straight eighth notes than playing like a shuffle groove yeah so i i you know the book kind of just shows how i took 16 note ideas and kind of just twist them basically and phrase them as triplets in grooves then I get into obviously concepts of six against four and playing against half note triplet. Um, all of them come with CDs and examples recorded on there, the digital download. Um, in my years of teaching for years, one of the biggest challenges I've always found is that, you know, parents would come for me lessons ago. Uh, my son studies piano. He's at a grade seven level, grade eight. But there's nothing really like that in drums. I mean, there is in the classical field. If you study that, so right. you're going to learn, right. you know, classical music, timpani, that. Mm. So o- over the years, I try to put together a drum set curriculum. I don't know if you can see behind me. There's that poster. There's a colorful poster. And, it, and it's based on this book I wrote with one of my teachers at my studio, Matt McFarland. It's about 200 pages where, you know, the whole... You know, kids have always been inspired with the whole martial arts, uh, you know, achieving that belt status. Like, I mean, I was a young kid. I only got up the green belt. So the the, the nice thing about that is we go step by step right to the black level. And, you know, once they pass that level, they get a strip of tape on the stick. So I'll I'll tell you what's really helped with that, too. So there's a step by step process going through that. And so even when somebody would sub in, oh, where's that student now? He's at level five. Mm. He's at the blue level. Mm. Oh, especially during this time doing online lessons, having a, you know, so we're going to turn to page 72. So mm. that's, that's very helpful. But one of the things at the end of the book, I, I, I recommend, you know, if you want to further more studies in jazz, here's a list of books and DVDs I highly recommend. Right. So, you know, you know, it's just like somebody's going to become a, a surgeon. They don't just have one <laughs> book on operating. <laughs> there, there's tons of information. So that's just available directly through me, drumkitmethod.com. And, and then the other one was just a little paperback book. I, I just, you know, it's called basically Finding Success as an Individual Drummer. It's just on my website, Drums in View, like the letter U.com. Mm-hmm. It's just personal stories on whatever your passion is. You could be a ballerina to a magician, the skill trade, and how do we make it being success, successful? Sorry, at that. You know, learning your craft, being uh, an open communicator, have a positive attitude, and have right. your business skills. So yeah. it shares a lot of like just, just different life lessons for me, and there's I some see. fun characters in that. So that's probably, you know, majority of, of the educational material that I've been using right now and stuff like that. And uh, it, it's nice, you know, when I get an email from somebody, somebody just sent me an email from Hungary. He said, wow. hey, I, I really like that example on your uh, book. I go, I appreciate it. So it, it, it's nice, the community of drumming that we're very open-minded to discuss and share things together. Oh, I, I love it. I love it. That's, yeah. yeah. Just, just the fact that you're telling me all these stories for the past uh, 30 minutes already is, uh, yeah, yeah, it goes by so fast. <laughs> Yeah. So, um, so much to talk about. Um, okay, so basically now you are kind of still teaching. You're still taking students, but online. Is that how? Yeah. What's, what's keeping you busy. Okay. Yeah. So during so during this whole COVID da- uh, time, um, I'm still teaching online as okay. well too. And I've just opened my studio to come back in. But but I, I you know. I'm related to drumming. I'll throw this in. You can edit. Sure. So I don't know if you know if I have a hot sauce business, actually. Yes, so, yes, yes. Uh, I, I, I've been focused. So funny thing, I'm actually going on Dragon's Den next week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I'm doing that. So, 
so so during this whole shutdown time, I was like, where do I put my energy into areas? Right. So that so one of the things I was always posting a lot of little videos on drumming to inspire and, and get students, and it helped build up a, a library of the online lesson thing, and right. and, and and it had. Has been working out well because the camera you see me like right now that mm -hmm. angle that's exactly where the students throne would be so i want right. them to get the same thing you know right. being there i mean and it works out well I, I find it's much more challenging for like a very beginner student the more advanced you are it is it's yeah, much exactly. easier so yeah so so during this time just doing that i mean a lot of the band gigs i play in a few tribute bands unfortunately you know the calendar has been scratched off and mm. rescheduling things for the following year mm. and uh and just doing my hot sauce thing, local farmer's market. I, I'm in a lot of boutique stores and stuff like that. You know, there's a scary thing to it. Salem's lot with two T's, so I don't get this sued by Stephen King. Salem lot. <laughs> scary hot sauces. So, you know, between between music and hot sauce, it's a nice it's a nice balance. It's a nice balance. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks but, so much, uh, uh, Jeff, for already yeah. uh, out of time. Um, I, thanks I, so I much. So, go ahead. No, no, I appreciate everything. Thank you for inviting me to be a part of this. It's great. It was wonderful. No, no, and, no, and no, no, no. And um, anyways, if you, they want to join you again, the, the uh, website would be? What, what's that? Sorry? I'm sorry? The, web, the website to join you again, just to, just to say it? Oh, oh, yeah. So, yeah. So, uh, um, so my website for uh, my drum stuff for my book is this drums in you, like D R U M S I N the letter U dot com. Right. And if you're curious about, if you're curious about my percussion group, Enviro Drum dot okay. org, and then on Instagram, it's just at Salem Drum. It's my Instagram account for that. Stuff Fantastic. Like that. Thank Perfect. you for Thank you for joining us. I wish you all you. the best with uh, everything yeah. uh, this year, and hopefully we'll see you uh, live or uh, somewhere yeah. selling you some uh, some t trying out some hot sauce. <laughs> Sounds great, man. Thank you very much. Okay, all the best, Dennis. All the Cheers, best. Take man. care. Okay. Bye. Take care. Bye bye. Very cool. Thanks, Jeff, for the interview. Very nice. Uh, moving on to the next interview. Um, this uh, fellow basically is from Montreal, like I said. Uh, guy plays pretty much everything. It's it's very, very cool to see. Um, from Montreal, was, uh, of course, studied at Vanier College. Uh, was one of the rising stars in 2004, the Drum Fest in Montreal. Uh, played with a lot of indie bands. Did the whole thing we most of us do, which is basically get with your band, uh, tour across the country with your band, something uh, that we all relate to. Uh, once that happened, moved to LA to uh, try his chances over there, and it worked out because he met none other than the guitarist from System of a Down to form his band called Scars on Broadway. Very interested to talk about that project. He's coming back to Montreal in 2015, did a lot of music production, for instance, for Oshiega, and ever since been uh, been busy with his own solo project called Manji Pride, where he, of course he plays and records everything by himself. So without further ado, very excited to talk to none other than Jules Pempena. And welcome, Jules. How are you? I'm doing very well. How are you, Benny? <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. Yeah. Um, so, a local Montreal, a uh, man who's yeah. basically been around the world, traveled with uh, many bands and uh, many different outfits. Yes, uh, sir. The thing I usually ask people uh, is, how did you get started? What what drawn you to, 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 to uh, music, or especially drums? In your case, you seem to be playing pretty much every instrument, but what started you at least with drums? Uh, yeah, I, I, I started on drums for sure. Um, well, actually, my father is a drummer, so... Yeah. So there was always a drum set in the house, you know, and uh, when he would leave, I would just, you know, like sneak around and grab the sticks and start to teach myself and like, you know, uh, you know, just kind of like learn the stuff that he was doing. And he was playing in like a, you know, like a wedding band. So it was just like a variety of tapes, you know, stuff, uh, some disco, some jazz, you know, some uh, some rock and roll, all that stuff. So I started young, just like learning, you know, just exposure to it. And um only started like really uh, to go after it, I guess, maybe like later on in my life, you know, because uh, I'd say around like 16, 17, it, like, you know, I started to take my first lessons. Up until then, I was just kind of uh, self uh, taught. And, yeah. yeah. But yeah, so that's how I got into it. I just Oops. kind of 
So musical family. I was family. born into it. <laughs> so musical family. Uh, did your did your dad uh, tour? Did your dad was a, a working musician? Was he? He was a working musician, yeah. um, but locally only. Yeah, it was more uh, the corporate scene and the wedding scenes and all that stuff. You know, right, just, right. You know, just goofing around. So, okay, yeah, I've always and, been a- and so so basically, did, did he teach you some stuff, or you just kind of listen to your own stuff and then like I want to play this and your music? He didn't teach me that much. If I want to tell you the truth, I don't <laughs> think he really. Yeah, I don't think he really wanted me to. Uh, to pursue it, you know, I think like uh, seeing, seeing, seeing that it was kind of like a difficult, you know, like road ahead. I think I think he kind of, um, you know, I mean, it was there, but like he wouldn't go out of his way to teach me. So I had to kind of like I had to go after it, you know, uh, you know, on my own and teach myself right, and, right, right. Right. and do my thing. But, okay. but yeah. So so then you went. Uh, so of course I read up on your stuff and I've come kind of been listening to your to stuff. We got many things to talk about. Cool, uh, cool, but cool. then you went to Vanier. You went to study. So how did that go? I how did that start? That was, I think, uh, the moment where where I was, where I, you know, like I really wanted to pursue it, because up until there, um, I mean, I had been in like high school bands, and you know, like I played, you know, everything up until there. But then, uh, right around, I, I guess, around eighteen, nineteen, where it's, you know, it's time to, it's time to pick your life, you know, it's time yeah. to pick, your, it's time to be, you know, <laughs> um, I went into computer science for like a little bit, you know, oh, wow. because I didn't, I mean, like I, you know, like I guess I didn't really think uh that it was a possibility mm. you know i just thought mm. it was something you know i saw what my dad did and i saw that okay well there's that you know and like mm. that wasn't extremely inspiring for me in terms of just like i don't know like it just like it didn't uh, draw me in but um i did love the music i just like i didn't think that there was a career in it so i was at computer science for a bit and uh you know, they say in the first uh, couple of years in computer science, they weed out uh, the people who shouldn't be there, you know. <laughs> yeah. so I got I got weeded, you know. <laughs> so, so, slowly I was, you know, I was just trying to pay attention to class and, uh, you know, the music was just, you know, uh, was coming to me all the time. And, mm. and I would find that like the whole class would go by and I would just be there, you know. Right, 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 right. Like, know? Many and, us, like many of us. Like many of us. Exactly, you know. <laughs> So, and then I remember one day uh, just working on an assignment all week and I could barely understand it or it just wasn't for me, you know, and I came to school and like I did my best and I had only done like, you know, like half the assignment mm. and, uh, and like I handed it in and I was like so depressed and I sat down <laughs> heard to talk about like the next, uh, you know, whatever, like the next assignment and I, it was totally over my head and I didn't understand anything anymore and I was like, you know what? guys i shook you know like i shook hands with like a couple of like my friends who i had made in computer science i'm like guys i gotta do this you know like i have to do what i want to do you know yeah, yeah. so i walked out and um and then at that point i had to take it seriously you know i mean if i was going to get into drums then i figured then you know like i wanted to study and i wanted to do it uh, the right way so i applied and and you know i had this goal of like i wanted to play at the montreal drum fest you know right right which like a did, thing right you know and you it's like the, especially at the time yeah. yeah you know the rising stars uh yeah. thing you know, at the time, it was kind of like one of those things that like you had to do, you know, it was like a path, you know, right, right. So whatever, like I put it in my head, I was like, you know what, I, you know, like next year, I'm gonna whatever, you know, I'll sign up and like, whatever, you know, I'll apply. And uh, so I studied hard that first year to get into Vanier to, you know, to learn all that, you know, uh, to pass the audition, that, you know, etc. With Alain Jalbert, you know, mm. watch well, what's up? <laughs> and um, he prepared me and then um and then, yeah, like within the first year, I was actually at the drum fest. Like they actually like made an extra slot for me, and nice. it was just it was kind of like a dream come true. And I was, and you know, you know, and it was like a total, like you know, just like a confirmation of saying that, like, yeah, yeah. Sometimes you gotta listen to that thing inside you, you know. That's oh, like, oh yes, oh you yeah. gotta go for it, man. You gotta go, you know. You, like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, and we, yeah. So, we, we've all go through that. I, I, it's, it's funny, just just a little story. I. I I did some studies uh, once. I once I did drumming, and once I went uh, a bit around the world myself. I went back to study, and I thought, "Oh, I'll take a, some programming, uh, you know, yeah. just to get into it." My yeah. God! Oh my God! Was it ever painful? <laughs> was it ever painful? I was like, "But but why? Why is it like this? What? But what's missing? Why is my cold now?" Anyways, it was. Yeah. And it's like, and it's like we, you know, it's like we feel like it has to be hard, and we feel like it has to be, you know, it's. You know, it's supposed to be that way. You know, it's like, ah, you know, you're supposed to do things that you don't like and you're supposed to like. Yeah, yeah no, exactly, you know, exactly. This is life, you know, but I mean, whatever. You find out that like, you know, I mean, either path uh, that you take, is st- it's still difficult, you know, it's still, it's not all, it's not all like rainbows and lollipops, you know, no, no. <laughs> like, but at least, you know, it's like you pick uh, your battle, you know, hmm. 
the, right. you know, the Nukem fighter a lot better. <laughs> so, so quickly, how was that? How was that moment on, on the, the drum fest for uh, for the Rising Star? How was that? It was like first first guy first guy of the day on Sunday. You know, really? like Horacio <laughs> Hernandez was like was like standing there, and everybody was like, I was, was on the side, and I was, you know, I was super nervous. I was just a kid. I, like I don't think I slept all night that night. I was just like <laughs> all tired. I came in like, but it went it went super well. You know. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, like as well as it could go, and <laughs> and yeah. yeah we just... Cool. Um, so moving on, basically. So then afterwards, once you did that, you were kind of uh, playing all over the place. Uh, yeah. In the Montreal area with a bunch of uh, different bands. You were basically, yeah. like it says, in a, you know, just kind of touring all over the place. Uh, how was that mm -hmm. experience? Uh, how was that back then? That was great. It's... Um, I mean, everything from the beginning, you know, uh, it's like the beginning was, was when I discovered, you know, like writing music and, you know, like and being in a band and, you know, it was like this whole world was opening up all at the same time, you know, like, mm. it was like, uh, it was like the day that I decided like to go into it, it was just like everything started happening at once, you know, so I was in a band and I was very hardcore about it. And, uh, you know, we bought a van and, you know, we yeah. just like went for it, you know, just like old school, <laughs> just like went for it. And like the MySpace days, you know, you would like, nice, like right. your friend on MySpace, you know, like uh, find a band in the town and, and swap shows, you know, and, and start, you know, and started there and just, you know, just doing that thing, you know, like one show at a time and, and sleeping in vans because we had no money and, you know, like, <laughs> and like washing in Lake Ontario, you know, <laughs> like, <laughs> doing, you know stupid shit that you do i think so a lot of people relate to that yeah for sure <laughs> absolutely absolutely yeah <laughs> i remember yeah. kind of uh, playing in calgary and waking yeah. up the next day into the mountains i didn't, I didn't even know i had parked the van in a in a in a parking lot with the mountains because it was nighttime yeah <laughs> yeah exactly and it's the yeah. next night, and i'm like holy, holy there's mountains here holy you know <laughs> yeah exactly it's like i've been woken up a couple of times uh sure uh, you can't be sleeping here <laughs> <laughs> huh? what Sounds good. Yeah. yeah. Well, those are those are formative years. I mean, I, I wouldn't trade those for 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 the world, really. I mean, absolutely. It's like the most. Ex Go yeah, ahead. it's like the most exciting thing in the world, right? Like you're finally. It was just like that feeling of being in the van with your hands on the wheel, and you're like, I'm actually on tour, you know. Like even yeah. though it's, you know, it's a small thing, and hopefully ten people come to your show, you know. But it's like the most exciting thing in the world. <laughs> so afterwards, basically, you uh, branched out and you moved to LA. So how was that? Yeah. What, what made you move to LA? Another uh, kind of, I mean, I don't want to say random, but um, pretty random, you know? I mean, if I yeah. tell the story, like exactly how it happened, it was just, sure. it was in between some tours uh, with Elephant Stone and um, it was just like some, you know, some downtime and I was, I mean, honestly, like I checked my horoscope <laughs> and my horoscope said, it's a great time to do something for your life and like uh, your career and your job. So I was like, you know what? I'm going to go down and like visit a friend of mine who was living down there, who I know from here, okay. Dominic. Uh, and so he was living out there and I just went to visit him. I went to stay. I just got like an Airbnb hmm. and I stayed, I stayed at like this lady's place. So anyway, that's a whole other story, but so I stayed at this lady's place for like a couple of weeks and uh, we had done a recording, Dominic and I, um, for a curious case for like a band that I had with him, which is kind of like, punk kind of uh proggy right. sort of thing you know right um he had a producer friend out there and we went to go and record some uh tracks at uh, matt sorum's house actually you know wow <laughs> yeah so while we were doing that the keyboardist of scars on broadway was there right i didn't know that scars on broadway was looking for a drummer scars on broadway is a uh, darren, uh, darren darren uh, 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 yeah. project from system of darren, right, yeah, right yes yes yeah uh, so my friend Danny was uh, the keyboardist in that band and um, he saw me play that day for the first time. It was like we met each other and uh, so the story goes, he messaged Darren like as soon as he saw me play, he's like, oh yeah, you know, this guy's, you know, like this guy's all right, he's a cool guy. And so he set up an audition. He's like, yeah, Darren wants to meet you in like three days, you know? Wow. And I was like, oh, shit, you know, because I didn't really know much about the band. I mean, like, you know, like I had like heard about it, obviously, like the name and yeah. but I didn't really know the music and stuff. I knew System, but um. So basically, I had like maybe three, four days to like learn a bunch of shit, you know, yeah. and like not so much in the style that I was used to playing. I mean, I was playing mm. in rock bands, but it's like very, you know, like system style. It's very, yeah. it's very, you know, it's up tempo. And I remember spending the next like three days exactly just icing, just icing my hands, like you know, like just going for it, and like it, it took so much out of me that like 
I was like running under the sun <laughs> to get into shape, you know? Yeah. And um, did you try to like chart it a bit or did you just trying to like uh, osmosis and just get it as much as possible? Just osmosis. That, I mean, that's how I learned. Things. It's like um, usually I'll chart things, but like like my first uh, way to learn stuff is I'll just like listen, you know, it's like listen uh, to the shit out of it. You know what I'm saying? Like, right, right, right. Just like listen to it, like while you sleep, while you eat, while you drive, while you, right, you know, right. like everything, everything. Just you know, and I was trying to learn as much as I, you know, like I could. So, so like then the day comes and like we go up to see Darren, you know, and like we're driving up the hills, you know, and like we're going to see this guy, and I was super nervous, obviously, because I'm like yeah. I can't let this like this thing, yeah, you know, yeah. like, like I can't let like, you know, like something like this pass, right? Mm. And I have to impress this guy, you know. So, mm. so we went up and and then I met him and. He was, he was, he was like very humble and down to earth, and like you know, like guy just kind of like hanging out in his room, you know, like, and uh, like it felt like we were friends right away, you know. I don't know, there was just mm. a thing. You know, he had like all these hockey jerseys up, you know. He's all into hockey, you know. So you know, just being a Canadian from Montreal, he's like, oh yeah, you know, like, like yeah. hockey. So right away, it was like, yeah, of course, you know. And we hung out a bit, and then finally we went for a jam, and uh, I don't, I'll just, I'll just never forget that that first jam that I had with him, you know, because I was. Just, you know, like in his house and like we all kind of set up. He has like, you know, like he's got a, he's got a jam space and, and we just went for it, you know, and like we did that, you know, that first song, mm. and it was just like a blur. It was, I just like, I gave it everything I had. I was like, I've been practicing for three. I just, ah, you know, I just like fucking let it rip. And I'll never forget, you know, like, it was like we finished like the song and he was just like, like I could see his face. It was like, fuck yeah. You know, like, like oh, that sounds great, you know? Good. And then he's like, uh, you know, uh, so did you learn any other songs? And I'm like, I learned the whole album, you know. Mm-hmm. And then we played the whole album right then and there. Because up to that, there was only one one album, or was it two? Or I don't. There was only one album. Oh, we wow. had a second one already, you know, like was made actually already. But uh, yeah, exactly. There was one uh, with John Dolmayan on drums. Mm. And uh, so that was it. So like, yeah. So that was like uh, that was like the beginning of the whole thing because then he turned around and he said, okay, like I think you should uh, stick around, you know, and. Mm-hmm. And so I did, and so like my two week vacation uh, turned into a few years uh, living out there. You know, I was like, I just didn't come back. You know, that's nice. That's so cool. That's a good story. And yeah. how how was touring with that? That must have been quite a. I mean, I, I, you, it was, you, you write about uh, being with the, the double bill with the Deftones and and so forth. Yeah, it was like suddenly you're like uh, you're on tour with your heroes out of nowhere. It was it was a far cry from from. Uh, from waking up in the schoolyard in your van, you know, but like, <laughs> from Calgary, yeah. from like, oh, we can't park your car here, sir. <laughs> yeah, no. Oh yeah. I mean, it was amazing. It was amazing. I, I like, it was like the first time that I had like a drum tech and like, mm. you know, just someone else was like, was like moving all the gear and, you know, mm, mm, mm. and, uh, the shows were just, you know, like huge shows. And I was playing in front of like some of my heroes there and mm. it was all surreal. It was very surreal. It was very, uh, just because it happened so suddenly like that it was it was like a little dream you know <laughs> very very cool but that yeah. was that must have been nice and then you didn't stay there though you you came back to i didn't stay there well then darren like went to, you know uh, to do some uh, some tours with system and uh scars wasn't really happening anymore for a while mm. so i um I mean, it was in the cards, you know, it was like, I just came back home and started to work on my own stuff. And I felt it was, it was just the time, you know, sometimes there's just like a moment where you have to, uh, you know, I was looking for gigs out there, but I, I, like, I sort of wanted to focus on my own music and get started on, on some stuff, you know, that that, like I wasn't doing out there, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because besides drums, I mean, you seem to play pretty much every instrument. You seem to sing, you seem to produce, you seem to do uh, a whole range of things. Uh, Could you talk about that a bit? Um, it's really just like a love for like all the process, you know what I mean? It's like, it's always, it's always just been like a love for like the process of making records, uh, for the process of making, you know, of like, um, of like writing songs. It's like, it started on the drums, it's mm. like where I focused all my energy and it's what I, you know, I tried to master the most. And then, you know, just being around like other musicians and them like leaving their stuff around. I mean, you know, like even in high school when my friends would, you know, uh, would come to my house and jam and then they would leave all their instruments. I would like slowly, you know, slowly like start to, you know, like to start to just, figure it out. And yeah, like, it would leave like the four track and I would like make like a little demo of myself and, <laughs> you know, with the four track and try. And that's where I started, you know, and slowly, you know, I took a few lessons here and there, like on guitar and, but again, like self-taught and I just, I just kind of go for it. Like I'm, it's like, I'm the type of, uh, you know, like the person, like I'll just like, I'll dive in first and then right. I'll think about it later, you know, it's like, I don't know what I don't know yet. You know, like I'll just, just like, try I'll it. Dive in. 
it's like with the video editing with the you know it's like i you know like i make videos all that stuff like yeah, yeah. If i had gone to film school and if i had known how little i didn't know <laughs> i probably would never get started right you know? right, right. Like, because you know you, don't just, have... you just go you know and then yeah because i don't have the right program the right camera or i should learn all these techniques before i get into there's, it and there's always something right there's always yeah. something so like uh the first videos i made even you know they're like you can see online it's like with you know the iphone 4 just like singing into my iphone 4 and then mm -hmm. you know mm. you start with that you start what you got would you, would you say basically that's just it's just natural for you to just create if you will just a, it's just a natural yeah thing. absolutely it's, it's yeah, not yeah. like an ego thing or whatever it's just like i just need to try something absolutely i'm so yeah. fascinated by it even uh, the recording and you know and the gear and the instruments and like how it gets recorded in the microphones and i just love it you know it's like i can't keep my hands off it it's like i was the guy that was like at the studio after like you know all the band would leave i'd still be there with like the mixing engineer asking it like a million and one you know like right right, right. you just have just, a, a curiosity yes yes exactly it's a curiosity and uh I guess that's it. Yeah, it's like really just like I love to do it. I mean, like I love to play with other people as well, and I love to uh, the collaborations. But then I also love the solo efforts. Sometimes, like I find that um, you learn something about yourself, and uh, you challenge yourself in a way that that is like way out of your comfort zone, like the singing and all that stuff. Like I didn't right. sing until much later on. I never thought, you know, that I could sing or that I, you know, it was really, it was not something that like I did like ever. I was like, you know, like shy, you know, like about singing, and I would. Uh, Sing like the backups in my band, you know, like the oohs and the ahs and you know stuff like that. But, <laughs> yeah, right, right. But you know, like that's what drummers do usually. Yeah. As what drummers do, you know. So <laughs> I was just and like you know, like again, I was curious, you know, like uh, what do I have to say? How do I write this? How you know, you know, like how can I sing this? And mm -hmm. a little bit at a time, you chip away, and then like uh, next thing you know, you're doing a lot of stuff, you know. Mm. Oh, that sounds good. Uh, yeah. Going back a bit to the drumming, if I may, uh, since yeah. it is a drum channel. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was listening to some of your drumming, and right. you, it's interesting. You seem to sort of start with an idea, and then sort of multi-layer it, so sort of add mm -hmm. like a little accent here, or sort of, and, and it creates this kind of like, I, I guess I can call it like a DJ effect, if you will. Yeah. Kind of like somebody's kind of spinning records and adding some layers on top. Right. Of it. Is that what you would call like the way you drum, or the way you you see it, or? I think over time, well, I think over time, like, I mean, I've never been um, a huge uh, soloist, you know, I've never been like huge on soloing and I've always been in bands and I've always been more addicted to songs and, you know, and yeah. songwriting. So, you know, I sort of, uh, you know, like, I guess I approach it like more compositionally, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, more yeah, like, yeah. it's like, here's a groove. And then, you know, it was like you say, you know, like, like, here's, here's an accent, here's a thing, here's a, I mean, I'll, you know, like I'll mess around with chops, you know, it's like, uh, you know. Nobody's looking, you know, you'll just, you'll just go for it, you know, <laughs> you know, you just go ham on it. But like, yeah, I suppose it's like structured, like, I guess that just comes from, from right. having an interest in songs and songwriting and, you know, like in doing something that's, that's mm -hmm. like listenable, you know, I find it's like very important, you know, that it's like it's something listenable and like, it's, you know, it's, it's musical and not just, um, just planning, yeah. uh, flexing, flexing your, uh, your chops, you know, yeah. And you, you add also a couple of, um, like, a pro I'm not sure what it is exactly, but some sort of uh, processors or some sort of sound effects to it as you're playing. Um, well, that's just like, yeah, well, that's just like, a, you know, like, again, like the natural extension. Like, after I record it, I'll take it into the Pro Tools and I'll do some mixing and I'll, ex you know, like, explore some different sounds and textures. And, you know, I'm just always, like, uh, looking to find something new. Looking okay, to so, find so it's done post-production, basically, is what... Uh, Oftentimes, yeah, okay. yeah. Oh, cool! Interesting. Very interesting. I kind of like it. It was interesting. It was kind of. I was almost right. dancing to it. Kind of. Uh, yeah, nice. <laughs> kind of feel to it. Um, time goes by. My God, it goes by so fast. Got yeah. about uh, five or six minutes left. Um, <laughs> so basically, yeah, it goes by fast. So basically, now <laughs> you're doing you're doing writing, your uh, music production. You're doing Main G Pride, which is your kind of your yeah. uh, your project. That's my right now. thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. So if you want to elaborate about that. Um, Manger Pride is just a thing that started really just an online thing. It was like in between like working with bands, I would just like when I had some time, I would like start to write songs and put up some videos and start to experiment with that stuff, you know, and as you go, it just kind of builds. It's like everything else, you know, you just, it starts, it starts to become like larger and larger. And now, and now I'm working on a full length record and, yeah. and, you know, I started to play some live shows, you know, like I had assembled a band when I came back from LA, I assembled a band and play that stuff. And, yeah, it's just my my yeah. labor of love, I guess. It's my, uh, you know. Your, your creative outlet, if you will. That's where you're my, my Yes, exactly. My creative outlet, exactly. 
where I do all the stuff, you know, I mean, it's like, I'm able to just, to, you know, to lay down uh, the bass tracks and, uh, you know, like the guitar tracks and, and just explore all the music I love and try to make something that's cohesive and, mm. you know, that has a message and a vibe and, 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 you know, that's, that's kind of like the thing that like excites me the most, you know, like aside from the drumming, you know, like the drumming is like one aspect of it, but like, again, you know, like the fact that you're saying it's multi-layered and all that stuff. It's like, I'm always kind of looking for like a larger picture. You know what I'm saying? Something I mean, your pride is like a, a very good spot for me to, <laughs> to fully, to fully try everything out, you know, like the video and the songwriting and the drumming and right, right. composition and, you know, so all of it together into one project, basically. All firing at 100% as much as I can. <laughs> is, there, is there a day where you're not creative? Is there a day where you go, oh, I got to take a break from all this? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, kind of. I mean, look, <laughs> like, I'm about to go on a trip right now to Letuk, okay? I'm about oh. to take a little trip. There you go. Um, I need to take like a bit of a break. And, and it's, it's kind of off, you know, like it's like off the grid, right? So there's no... There's no um, there's no cell phone connection, you know, there's uh, no electricity. It's like a cabin up there. Right, right, right. And uh, this morning I went to rent a generator because I want to bring my laptop and I want to record like uh, some performances. <laughs> you know? So, no, no, no. The answer is no, there's not, there's not a day. <laughs> I have a generator. You should see I have like wires everywhere here. I'm trying to like assemble. How am I going to pull this off, you know? How am I going to charge my <laughs> GoPro? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I have like a hundred foot cable to put the generator in the woods so that it's not too noisy. Oh man, the creative juices are strong with this one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Well, uh, we're already out of time. It's already been 25 minutes, Jules. It's been an yeah. absolute pleasure. Uh, it's been cool uh, meeting you and knowing about yeah. you. Uh, Thank you. It was kind of, it was kind of cool to watch all those videos and watch uh, a bit of your what you've done and that sort of thing. So very nice. Thank you for in coming to Drumfield Cafe and. Uh, I wish you all the best. I hope that basically, uh, like I wish to all the musicians, COVID kind of slowly goes away. We can all get uh, creative again and be uh, yes. alive. Yes, everybody people. hang in there. Everybody hang in there and do your thing and like, you know, find new ways, you know. There's like uh, new ways of doing things and yeah, yeah, we'll find our way. We'll all find our way, you know. Yeah. We'll all find our use, way. Use those creative juices. <laughs> Just keep juicing. <laughs> Thanks so much right. for having me, man. So thanks a lot, uh, Jules, and uh, all the best to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Take care. Peace. Thank you so much, uh, Jules. Very inspiring interview. Thank you so much, sir. Moving on to the last interview of the evening, a uh, Nashville drummer from the Nashville music scene who's been playing with Jason Aldean for quite some time now. And together, their collaboration has made 26 number one hits. Very impressive indeed. Uh, that's, of course, caused them to play pretty much everywhere, from TV shows, uh, stadiums, arena, you name it, they've pretty much played it. Um, if he's not playing with Jason, he's played with a ton of other artists, of course. Uh, Bob Seger, Kenny Rogers, Miranda Lambert, uh, just to name a few. Uh, causing him, of course, to be named Modern Drummer Magazine's Country Drummer of the Year in 2016, 17, and 18. And uh, if he's not doing all of that, drumming, he's a motivational speaker. So very curious and very excited to talk to none other than Mr. Rich Redmond. All right, man. Yeah, I, I got a little light here to make things look better, and uh, it gets so hot. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, I got the same thing going actually. So um, Montreal, beautiful, but I've never been because you know, with country music, we don't we get to the Edmontons and the Calgarys, right, but we right, never right. get to Quebec or Montreal. No, that well, I'm about to ask you about that because it is it is kind of um, a music that is extremely popular. I mean, the States is extremely popular, but it's something that's not as popular over here. I mean, we do have a couple of festivals here and there, but of course in Francophone, yeah. but none of the, yeah. the, the, the hugeness uh, that is in the States. I mean, it's extremely popular. And I was watching a couple of your shows and I'm just like in awe of the size of the people there and just the show. I mean, it's just, it's, it's amazing, really. Mm. Um, yeah. Well, thanks, man. And I want to learn about you a little bit too. So, <laughs> Cool. Uh, we got a lot to cover. Uh, so welcome officially to 
Truffles Cafe. Um, I usually dabble just into the beginnings, just to know where you're coming from and what's your background and then how you got to where you are today. And of course, you talk about that in your crash course. So yeah. I'm going to move up to from drumming out to the way to Nashville and then basically to where you are today and what you're doing and how can people get in touch with you and that's sort of Past, thing, so. present and future. I like it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, it's like, it's like ghost of Christmas past. You know, I was thinking like this year is just flying by before long we're going to be buying christmas gifts for everyone so you know yes 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 it's going to be crazy but uh yeah so for me thank you so much for having me this is great um i you know i started um i tell everybody when dinosaurs roam the earth uh <laughs> ni- 1976 i took my first drum lesson right. and i and i had the uh, the stick control book and the right. george and the uh the syncopation for the modern drummer the bible and i don't know what i think i lent those copies out to students and they took off with them but it was so cute because i had these coffee stained books with the and my teacher would write the lessons you know like october 1st 1976 right. so that sucks that i lost that stuff but yeah i was just kind of like hitting everything inside i was just super high energy and my dad was like hey kid do you want to play the drums and so my I got. I went to a teacher in Milford, Connecticut, kind of the New England area. I grew up in this town called Milford, Connecticut. Very New England. Had the town square and the little duck pond and the mm. courthouse, mm. and right by the, um, you know, you can go to the beach. And uh, you know, I was always very enterprising. I always had a paper route, and I delivered. I raked leaves and I shoveled snow. So I was mm. always a pretty hard worker. I got, I really got into it. I loved the drums. My teacher said. Hey, this kid's doing well. He taught me how to hold the sticks. And I was playing with some Joel Roth. There's a Joel Rothman book called um, The Encyclopedia of Rock and Roll Drumming. And it was just things like, you know, and learning how to read it and getting the coordination together. And then when I ended up moving to Texas in 1981, my dad got a job um, in Texas. We moved the whole family 2,000 miles to Texas. And that ended up being great because Texas is so into music education. Mm. They have marching bands and concert bands and really... It's a really great program uh, for music education. And I started in the fifth grade band, learning how to crash the cymbals and warm nice. up the bass drum and do a thumb roll on the tambourine and play the glockenspiel and tune the timpani and follow a conductor. And that kind of started my path. Very nice. No, that's so important uh, to have just an education like that. This, it's funny because I was having a discussion with a friend and he's teaching uh, first graders and he's saying like it's so important to just initiate them to music, whatever it may be, you know. So, Yeah, I hope, I hope that after all this madness that's happening in the world, I'm hoping, I'm seeing a pattern and I'm hoping that school art, dance and music classes are, aren't canceled when we mm. all get back into the room at the same time, you right, know, right, right. but there are some people that are doing some nice virtual programs like, you know, the school of rock. And uh, yep, I just yep. did a video um, training series for this uh, group here in Southern California called rock stars of tomorrow, where the kids are like learning virtually, you know, from like say white snakes, guitar player or Jason really? Aldean's drummer. And they're learning really? songs that they want to learn. And, okay. but you know, with the latency, you know, with Zoom or yeah. even Cisco WebEx, we really aren't to the point where we can play with each other without that millisecond of, of, yeah, of, yeah the just, delay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> or that oh, melody we'll just stop a minute. I need to see to teach you something. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So then you move on to uh, classical studies, though. That's quite that's quite a leap. Yeah, you know, I'm really happy. I learned how to, you know, play John Philip Sousa marches and you know, jump, 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 bum, bum, jump, you know, and playing pomp and circumstance at graduations and learning how to choose the right mallet to play the softest note on the glockenspiel and how to warm up a symbol and really mm. create those colors mm. and and yeah playing playing 21st uh 20th and 21st century music was very you know reading like giant scores mm. and um you know when i was in college i got my two degrees in music education with an emphasis in jazz and classical music so cool. i had to play things like frank zappa's the black page and you know 20th century uh prepared percussion where you might have like a a field drum and a set of bongos and then a snare drum for, for my degree, I actually had to write a, like a forward thinking classical piece. And so I called it uh, popcorn. And what I did is I put <laughs> popcorn in the microwave. Okay. 
I recorded the sound of the popcorn being popped, and then I put a metronome on, on 60 BPM, which is like a second ticking by on your clock. Yep. And then I transcribed all the rhythms that happened against the 60 BPM. <laughs> and I took those rhythms and then I uh, arranged them for field drum bongos and, and snare drum. And then the way you would come out is that the three performers would come out in their tuxedos press start on the microwave for whatever it was, three minutes, and then perform the piece. You know, so <laughs> that kind of stuff. And then playing in big bands and playing fusion around Dallas and playing smooth jazz and doing jingles for McDonald's and the Texas mm. lot. That's all kind of informs your musicianship and your experience and then the story that you can tell. And then your skills that you have, um, which are great because, you know, when you have your skill set together, you can pretty much, you know, uh, play with a wider variety of people. And yep. the wider variety, the farther you cast your net, the easier it is for one of those opportunities to actually come to light. And so thank God I met a young Jason Aldean right. in 1999. And from that relationship with him and his band changed my life forever. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, but then you, so you had to move to Nashville to, to, to meet Jason or how did that work? Yeah. Out? Okay. Yeah. So, I was auditioning. I was living in Dallas, Texas. And I was reaching out to some friends of mine because I always say to people, look, at if you want to do something, you want to create something, you have a dream, enlist the help of your friends or people mm. that have already done it that you look up to that you can model. So I literally just, this was pre-Facebook. I mean, I had a pager and I would pull over with my pager and return the page <laughs> right, to right. see if somebody wanted me for a gig. Right. And sometimes with my mom just going, hi, son, I'm just making sure you got my care package and that you're okay. Because, uh, you know, but um, that's sweet. <laughs> I, yeah, I asked a friend of mine, hey, do you know anybody looking for a drummer on a national or, or international level? And he turned right. me on to Trisha Yearwood, Dina Carter and Barbara Mandrell. So I was funding all these auditions in Nashville, Tennessee, and all the band leaders were telling me, hey, it's between you and this other guy. The mm. other guy always lived in Nashville. Mm. So three times in a row, I saw a pattern. I said, that's it. I gave my band two weeks notice and I moved to Nashville with my Toyota pickup truck, one set of drums, my black cat cha-cha. And um, we went boldly into the night. And after two years in Nashville of waiting tables, Parking cars, making copies, substitute teaching, playing every gig I possibly could. Mm. I met a young Jason Aldean. And people always say, to, say, hey, um, can I get a gig and live in, you know, Montreal or Quebec or Des Moines, Iowa or Miami, Florida? Can I get a country music gig? It's going to, I say, it's going to be so much harder because it's all relationship based. And yeah. so you got to go to the watering hole. Yeah. You know, and sometimes you risk your life to go to the watering hill. I'm, I'm hooked on Facebook. I watch animal videos. And so I'm, <laughs> I'm hooked on the, um, all of these animals that go to the watering hole and then the crocodile that risk their life and the crocodiles come and they <laughs> eat their face off. And I'm thinking to myself, that's the music business. You got to go to the watering <laughs> hole. You got to go to where the action is yeah. and you are risking getting your face chopped off by a crocodile. Right, right, right. And you were talking about that, the fact that the fact that you may, you know, actually get rejected like so many times before you actually land something that you like or that people sure. say, okay, I'll take you, for instance. Yeah. And you do a lot of things that you don't like and you play a lot of music that is less than satisfying. And sometimes you might even play with musicians that aren't very good. But if you show up and you are the most prepared, you're the first one there, you're the last one to leave, you have a smile on your face, mm. you could take direction. You're totally checking every box professionally. Mm. And you got some jokes, you're pretty quick on your feet. You know what I mean? You're dressed appropriately. You're covering all the bases. Mm. You do that time and time and time again, people are going to talk. Mm. And it could take five minutes from of moving to a Nashville You can meet somebody at baggage claim, mm. or it might take five years. Mm. More often than not, it's five years. Mm. But I think I think as drummers, especially, we're sort of like that behind the drums, and we're like trying to you know lead the band, and we're more shy. It's kind of harder yeah. for us to go, "Hey, how you doing? I'm a drummer. You know, okay, call yeah. me up, think about me, that sort of thing." It's it's hard. It's hard. It's hard to sell each other ourselves compared to a singer. Yeah, I think instance. yeah, you're 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 playing. I call it the three P's. You're playing your personality and your people skills. So your playing has to be at 150, 200%. Mm. People can never worry about your musicianship. That's the expectation. Yeah, and then. 
your personality. Some people are introverts, some people are extroverts. I'm lucky that it comes to selling myself and crashing parties that comes relatively easy to me. Right. And then your people skills, how you interact with people. And if somebody does give you an opportunity or gives you their card or says, call me tomorrow, what a lot of people don't do, 99% of the people in the world will not follow up you know, mm, as right, instructed, right. or right, you, they won't right. be forward thinking and say, Hey, we were about five drinks in last night. So I don't know if you remember, but you mm. invited me to coffee. So I'm mm. taking you up on it. Mm. Right. And right. so for 15 years, it was me, to, you know, trying to take people to coffee. And now I can float away on a river of coffee. Because once you're able to maybe check a box, you get a couple of professional credentials under your belt, people want to know, how the heck did you do that? Was it an audition? What was it? And, and I say, look at out of the hundreds of jobs that I've had as a professional working musician over the last 30 years, maybe five of them were audition based. Mm. They all were about personal relationships and mm. people knowing, hey, you need a drummer? Call Rich. You know mm. what I mean? And that's, mm. that's the key is that getting to that point where you can be one of five trusted people on someone's list. Right, you know? right, right. Yeah. So yeah, well, it takes sure. time. You got to be patient. You know. No, for sure. So take me through a, a show with with Jason. I'm, I'm very curious yeah. to know how how this works because, like I said, I watched uh, especially the one where you're rocking the stadium in 2015, I believe, from your website. Yeah, I can't YouTube. wait to do another stadium tour, man. Yeah, I know. I can imagine for you it'd be such a, you know, but it's. I mean, it's a huge production, so it's a lot of the, you know. Are you driving all of that? Like, how does it work exactly? Yeah. So our band is really a. It's like you know, it's a it's a it's a definitely a country rock hybrid. Hey, heavier on the rock side of things mm. but then the storytelling and then the structure of the songwriting is com com is in we're i'm just i'm so lucky that i get to play these incredibly well written songs right you know a song like tattoos on this town that is like the the imagery of you know people growing up in a small town and the that the fact that they can leave their initials on in the bark of a tree mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. they can look at the water tower and they spray painted the water tower. And it's just like the storytelling of the heartland of America. What happens really between New York and LA, we hear about what happens in New York and LA, but real, the true story of America is like what's happening in the middle. right? No. Um, so we kind of address that, but we dress it up with like big crunchy riffs and writing crash symbols and rim shots and all that kind of stuff. So, um, you know, our typical venue is in the summers, we play amphitheaters. So that's anywhere between 18,000 and 24,000 people. And then occasionally we'll do like that 2015, we did a double bill with Kenny Chesney. So it was like all of his fans and all of our fans. Mm. And so then you can get 60 to 80,000 people in a stadium. So the only really difference there is that the way you get to the stage is you, you ride a golf cart, right? <laughs> and then when, you, when you do arenas and amphitheaters, you know, you're right backstage, the dressing room's right there. And it's like five minutes, everyone, boom, places. Mm. We're at the side of the stage. Um, I do a little quick motivational talk to the band and we put yes. our fists together. And we're like, yeah, it's like a sports team taking this, taking the field. And then we go out there and it's like, we pretty much set the, um, the, the set list for the entire year. So we'll right. go into rehearsals for about a week okay. and then we'll, um, do maybe a run through the first night of our show. We'll go in the night before the, the first, the first uh, show of our tour. We'll yeah. go in the night before, before. set yeah. everything up, make sure everything is cooking and is working and everything is rocking. We got the pyro, all the lights are dropping in the right spot. All, everything's working out. Hmm. And a lot, and mostly we've been playing these songs for so long. It's really about the text. Like there's, we have 24 songs in the set. There's 24 different guitars being passed after every song. Okay, really? And they have gotten so good at coming out and wearing the black and coming out in the dark and handing <laughs> someone their guitar just in time for me to start the song. And so like, yeah. you know, most modern bands, everything is on um, a grid, is on, is on a click track. So mm -hmm. we're almost like a recording band, a studio band, but okay. we're on stage and we're trying to have the 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 chutzpah or the fire or the um animalism of a 16 year old band right, right, you know right, right. and so we're trying to preserve that right, so right. we try to play with the with the methodicalness the execution of a studio band hmm. but with the youth of 
a bunch of guys wearing Chuck Taylors and and <laughs> tight and tight jeans that were were real just overly tight, um, and just have a great time. And we just play those suckers down. Yeah. And you know, I'm just so fortunate to be with you know my best friends in the world, and we finish each other's sentences. And Jason is incredible because he gives us so much freedom to be our own artists on our own instruments and bring our own thing to the table. That's interesting. And the songs are incredible and he's very encouraging and yeah to have that band that amount of time is just and also it's great that that he is hitting this unique fan base 15 to 55 male and female really? that's like wow. impossible yes. and then you have huge pop stars like like your maroon fives and people mm. like that that don't have that wide of a um you know what i mean it's like yeah, I know, for sure. an act like that you might have 15 to 35 male and female yep. but to have that kind of an age gap for both sexes uh pretty neat mm -hmm. but it just yeah. goes to show how popular that style and of course what he does is you know yeah. reaching a lot of people actually yeah it's cool but yeah but yeah exactly so i was watching you play and yeah exactly i mean it's simple stuff but it's all in the attitude it's all in the way you drive the band yeah. it's all in the way you you know get on the back beat for two and four and you know making sure yeah. that you know everything's present so um I, so i guess my next question is what makes you i'm just curious what makes you such a popular or at least the the renowned country uh drummer because you were named at least three times i believe 2016 2017 and 18 as yeah. the best uh, country drummer of uh of modern drummer magazine so congratulations well thank you so much i mean you know the funny thing about that is like when i when kids start saying or they ask you who is your favorite drummer and I'm like, oh, you opened up Pandora's box, right? Because what is the best? What is the best mean? Exactly. Yeah. Is it the fastest? Is it the person with the most chops? Is it the person with the fastest feet? Is it the person who has the best gig in the world? I mean, and what is the best gig? What does that mean? Hmm. So my thing is, is um, I have learned over the years, but when I was getting my master's degree and I was playing in the one o'clock jazz band at right. North Texas State, mm. playing bebop music, playing fusion, playing in odd times, that that informs how I am playing my version of whatever country music is. And that's how our band, mm. you know, we got a guitar player that loves Van Halen. We got a bass player that loves U2. We got a steel player that drew, grew up on cr traditional country music. We got our friend Jack who, you know, loves Foo Fighters, but grew up on like 60s and 70s. Right. And then I'm like, they, um, I'm an overeducated rock drummer. So basically, <laughs> I am a rock drummer. When I wake up in the morning, I'm a rock drummer. But I'm overeducated. I have so much experience playing different kinds of music that it informs it and you bring all those things together. And so we were able to kind of change things. But what I've learned over the years, it's way more difficult to play simple and transparent and mm. stay out of the way than mm. it ever is to play dense note groupings mm. um, when you're in a Return to Forever uh, tribute band or you're doing a, the Mahavishnu thing. It's like... Mm -hmm. It's incredible stuff, but it's way more simple to play kick and snare and kick and snare and have the meters be exactly the same mm -hmm. and the passion the same and the placement same and have it be studio tight in front of 80,000 people. Mm -hmm. That is so difficult, but I've had so much time to work on it that it becomes, it's my modus operandi. That's like what mm -hmm. I do. Mm -hmm. And um, now, can I still go sit in at the Holiday Inn and play Girl from Ipanema or go play with the community, um, the community jazz band over here in Beverly Hills? Yeah, probably. No problem. Because that's like wearing an old pair of shoes as well. Right, right, right. You know? It's something um, new. Yeah. Yeah. But it's yeah. like, um, it's the whole key to playing popular music is staying out of the way of the vocal. Mm -hmm. And when people ask, you know, what it really is the job of the drummer the dr the drummer's job is to, to to find the beat play it perfectly in time but make it feel great and make it groove right so beat time and groove and then doing that with a smile on your face and making it easy for the band to do their job if you're making it easy for the band to do their job and for that male or female whose name is on the marquee who's cutting you a check if you make their job easy, you'll keep getting invited to the party. And let's face it, getting a steady job in the music business is one of the hardest things to do. Yeah, for but sure. I think that's a goal. I think that's a goal. I mean, my original goal was to be like a Greg Bissonette and be able to play TV and film scores right. and then go tour with artists in a multiple 
variety of styles. Mm. But, but then at the same time, I really admired guys like Kenny Aronoff and Liberty DeVito, who were able to hold down jobs for 14, 15, 30 years with our, I think, uh, I think uh, Kenny was with Mellencamp for 17 years. Yep. And I think um, Liberty, who I just had on my podcast, had his job for 30 years. Yeah. And, and I'm already at 20. I'm almost to 21. Cool. But it's funny you mentioned those two drummers because that's the two drummers that came up to mind when I was watching you. Yeah. And I'm, I'm a huge fan of Liberty. Liberty is, people don't know enough about Liberty, I think, personally. But yeah. I saw I saw him play. He, there, we have a drum fest here in Montreal. And yeah. I saw him play the Billy Joel stuff. And I was just like, I mean, he hits hard. Like, he, he really drives the thing, drives those uh I know. Those See, tracks. these guys inspire yeah. me because yeah. Liberty just turned 70. I think mm. Kenny is 67. Mm. And these are the guys that are taking their vitamins every day and getting yeah. their eight hours sleep and drinking lots of water and doing yeah. their crunches. I mean, Li Liberty, um, you know, gave himself a hernia from doing crunches. You know, I mean, it's such, it's such a physical instrument. People are it like, is. well, don't you get a, don't you get a workout from playing the drums? I'm like, yeah, I have to work out so I can play like that. Exactly. Otherwise you're going to hurt yourself. I mean, exactly. just, you know, if you don't have good technique, I mean, I use the molar technique. So there's this big whipping motion mm -hmm. and I'm cracking rim shots. But if you're to deconstruct what a rim shot is, you've got a piece of wood that's in your hand. That piece of wood is hitting a piece of plastic that's torqued up. It's also hitting a piece of metal. And you're doing that tens of thousands of times a night yeah. for 30 years. Yep. And God bless, by the grace of God, I've had no physical problems because the head and the stick are only in touch with each other for a split second mm, mm, right, you get right. in you get out it's almost mm. like you're a navy seal boom you know <laughs> and and so that's why technique is so important i think mm. to for not only for tone production but for maintaining a a, a lifelong career Mm -hmm. no? But I think um, aiming for that Greg Bissonnette kind of thing is is a good goal because as sure. you as you as you said yourself, you know you've got all these different hats and you can play all these different things. But then you use what you use at the at the right context at the right time and you know playing for sure. the song basically. So I think the goal for a lot of people should be to get. I tell my young, I say get a gig. Like mm -hmm. not one that's just on Friday and Saturday night. I'm talking like a career gig mm -hmm. that you can try to put a little money aside, buy an affordable car, buy real estate, have a lifestyle. And that's usually the, the only way you're going to do it because it's so hard to string it all together as a freelancer. Mm -hmm. And the only way to really do it as a freelancer is to live in a Montreal, Los Angeles, New York, right, Nashville, right. Yeah. one of those markets where you can work five, six nights a week but i remember working six nights a week in dallas texas and i think i made maybe thirty thousand dollars i mean i killed myself mm -hmm. schlepping drums in and out of uh back you know clubs and yeah, yeah, yeah. in the kitchen at the hotel for the weddings and it's like it was exhausting yeah, thank yeah. god i was 25 years old you yeah know? exactly but in your 40s you're like oh, i'm not sure i want to do this again though. i know i smell yeah. like ben gay it's just horrible <laughs> uh so much to talk about let's let's quickly uh, touch upon um crash course yeah uh, and also uh, you have a couple of courses on your website uh, drumming in the modern world and uh, also for drumming lessons drumming in the modern world i was curious if you could touch that as well i'm curious yeah. to know more about that yeah drumming in the modern world is my um it's my little uh love note to the music business to say thank you because um I met Vic Salazar at Vic's Drum Shop in Chicago. He's kind of like the backbone of the Chicago music scene. Okay. And he had this beautiful five-star drum shop. And and he's just a friend. He's a friend of the drumming world. And he said, Rich, I was 44 years old at the time. He said, this is the time for you to do like a DVD. But DVDs were going out. But right. he introduced me to this great gentleman who's a great drummer and a great filmmaker, a great friend of mine, Eric Doris. And Eric was responsible for filming and directing all the Todd Zuckerman Method and Mechanics DVDs. So okay. um, Eric and I set aside a week and we did, you know, an 18 hour days in a beautiful world class studio in Nashville where Johnny Cash recorded and Dixie mm. Chicks recorded. Nice. And I got the beautiful robotic jib and multiple cameras and a film crew and i kind of spared no expense and i went and it's it's basically a five and a half hour training series um shot in hd with high quality audio it's about 110 
educational mini movies sure. and it's things like me de deconstructing the uh, Jason Aldean songs. It's me performing songs in a wide variety of styles. It's me talking about the Nashville number system, how to read a chart, how to create a chart, how to overdub percussion, how to set up your cue system in the studio, create loops, get a gig, keep a gig. Mm -hmm all the stuff of making a living in the music business that mm. a lot of guys aren't talking about because you know there's a lot of dvds out there where they're like okay i'm going to solo against clave and seven eight and i'm going right. to do one-handed rolls and i'm going to play everything that i can with my hands that i can with my feet which is great eventually you get to a point in your life where it's like you decide how good you want to be mm. and so I don't know what the what the point would be for me to have incredibly, incredibly, insanely fast Thomas Lang feet. Right, right, right. I don't know how that would impact my career. So, <laughs> so I'm I'm trying to talk about the things and share the information so people that if they can play a great beat and they they get a great tone and they're a nice person who covers all the bases and they want to go to a New York, LA, or Nashville, they're going to have this information in their back pocket to have a fighting chance. So basically, you just go to richremond.com. It'll link you to drummingintomodernworld.com, and for 99 bucks, one-time fee, you stream it for a lifetime. Um, also, on that same page, um, I have a, another gift to the world, which is basically every Jason Aldean song I've ever recorded is fully transcribed, oh, and really? you can download those for free. Okay. So if you're a student that wants to work on your reading and wants to work on that style, It'll be very helpful. And then I have a lot of teachers and college educators that are like, yeah, we use these for, for recitals because the kids have to play along to a track. We grade them and then they're killing two birds because they're having to read. At the same nice. Time. Nice. So. Nice. Exactly. That's cool. Uh, last things we're up to uh, last two minutes. Uh, anything else? What's going up? What's going up with you with the uh, COVID situation? Are you still active? What are you, where are you putting your yeah, energies? Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, we, we, we kind of, uh, stopped. Um, uh, do we fit, we didn't do our last two tour dates cause this thing hit us at about March 12th. So March 13th, I came out to sunny Los Angeles, spent some time quarantined with my girlfriend. Mm. And then I'm out here just, you know, teaching online drum lessons. Yeah. I'm on my pad doing my thing. Um, I fly to Nashville frequently to go do recording sessions. I'll be there this Friday playing one track on a new Rascal Flats record. Oh, nice. And then the next day, Saturday, I'll be tracking in my own studio, Crash Studio. So I'll be doing four modern rock, tra modern rock tracks and then a country track for clients around the world. And so that's another way that I can, you know, take the music business into my own hands and try to control my own destiny. Mm. And then I do things like I do motivational speeches and talk about my book, you know, right. Crash Course of Success. And th I believe this is av available in Canada. It's just on uh, Amazon Canada. You can get the real book, you can get it as an ebook, or you can get it on Audible and I read you the book. Oh, nice, nice. For those and then around that, I'll do like corporate speeches and everything is on online now. So, um, yeah, if people want to learn kind of more about me, that richredmond.com will tell you about my drumming, teaching, speaking, products, and even even acting. I'm studying acting. In oh, nice, so nice. Having a cool. good time. Uh, out of time, unfortunately. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time. I know you're yeah, way back there. And uh, thanks so much, uh, Rich. Very inspiring and very, I think, some very sage words about uh, about making it and how to get, uh, you know, how to get through, I think. Yeah. Wonderful. Yes, again. Awesome. Thanks so much, Rich. All the best for you. Thank you. And take care. God bless. Keep in touch, brother. Bye-bye. So that was Rich Redman, a uh, very interesting fellow. Some sage words, I think, about uh, making it in the business, especially in the States. So thanks for joining us. Thank you for being with us at Drumfield Cafe. You can uh, watch uh, episodes and know about us at Facebook, YouTube, and, of course, Instagram. And uh, thanks so much for being with us. Stay tuned for the next episode. And from all of us, take care. <laughs>